Okay, welcome along to our Facebook Live session, live at the Installer Show. You all know that we've been doing this on the Facebook group for the last 18 months, and we thought it'd be a really great idea to get these guys face-to-face -face in person here to answer questions from the crowd and anything that else we want to talk about. So first off, I'm going to let them introduce themselves over to Richard. Hi, I'm Richard from Midwell's Plumbing Heat and Supplies. Hope you're well. Half half bearded, but you know, still here. Um, hopefully, it'll be a good discussion for you guys. Going to talk through obviously the commissioning checklist and uh, everything you need to do when you commission heating systems. Over to Rob. Hi, I'm Rob Berridge from uh, heatengineer.com. We're a software company which do heat loss calculations for all low temperature building systems and compliant with new Partel building regulations. Uh, if we don't do heat calcs, we're going to be in trouble in the future. So that's the uh, hopefully the start of the process. We'll see. And over to Kim. Thanks, Rob. My name's Kimbo. Yeah. Oh, my name's Kimbo, and I sort of pick up where Rob leaves off. And uh, using his heat loss, we then work out how to design the system uh, most efficiently. So I run courses around the UK in about 20 locations, also in Northampton. Uh, and they're a two-day course, and it's essentially on hydronics. Hi, my name is Rhiannon. I work for a company based in North Devon, Solar PV Tech and Solar Heat Tech. And I do all the surveying and design for the heat pump systems and the solar panels. So um, most of you know that we've been covering off on these Facebook industry panel chats, um, talking about how you guys can make systems more efficient now with small things and you don't need to change too much. But there's all sorts of education that needs to happen around that. And this is where these guys have been sharing their amazing knowledge. So. The first thing we need to talk about is the heat loss calculation and why it's this bit. Every calculation and every bit of efficiency and uh, accuracy has got to start somewhere. And the biggest problem that we've got is that we've not been doing calculating. We've been guessing for probably over 50 years so far. Um, it's, uh, it's a wonderful time to be part of the industry now because there seems to be more accountability coming forward, which is kind of what we really need. And every single thing starts from a heat loss calculation. If you don't have the heat loss calculation to start with, you are guessing every single thing further downstream. So there's a procedure for a reason. And this is why these heat loss calculations need to be done. Thankfully, uh, government have now sort of uh, stuck their oar in, so to speak. And they are now accepting the fact that this needs to be done. And they've now mandated it through Partel building regulations and minimum flow temperatures or maximum flow temperatures, we should say, the 55 degree flow temperature. But we've got to... We've got to do the calculation, make sure that we can design the system that is going to work on those flow temperatures. But also, once we've done that, we've then got to design the downstream system, the hydronic system, and get all those working, which obviously is where all my other colleagues come uh, in involved with as we go forward. Uh, yeah. Yeah, OK. So once we've got an accurate room by room heat loss, we can start applying a bit of basic logic to it and say, well, look, if I need maybe 900 watts of energy in this room, to keep it warm when it's minus four outside. If I can work out what the flow rate is uh, for 900 watts and I supply a flow rate of 900 watts into the radiator, makes you ask the question, why do we need TRVs and why do we need room stats? Because really we don't. We rely on them because boilers at the moment are very forgiving. We can fit any old size boiler, any old size pump, slack handful of any size radiators, any old bits of pipe that we've got knocking about, fire it all up and it's all so oversized that we're always going to get more energy going into the rooms than we need and so what we do is we leave all of this to five or ten pounds worth of trv to control everything and of course that's not what good design is all about um so obviously we've got to think about comfort as well so two sides to the to the coin of um like kimbo said you know in a perfect world we wouldn't have trvs we'd have flow setting valves and then we would basically have the correct flow rates the problem we have is because we we have a, we have systems that are thrown together you know we've not like rob said for 50 50 odd years we've we've just not cared about this stuff and i don't know quite we try and all ask the question where it all went wrong because you know, our ancestors actually used to design this stuff, believe it or not. You know, when we actually had heating systems in the first place, someone actually sat down and did the maths. We've got to the point where we, re we don't really know what we're doing. Do you know what I mean? We're installers. We're out there doing the jobs. We don't really know what we're doing. We're chucking boilers on walls. Is that really what we want to do? No, it's not. We want to 
do the heat loss calculations correctly. We want to do the, the system design correctly. We want to size the boilers correctly. We want to then install them correctly, commission them correctly, and set them up. The list goes on. It's a long list of things you've got to do. Hence, we've kind of done this. So, da -da -da, so a little bit of a summary. So what we're kind of saying by this, these are sort of the key points that you need to do in order to commission a system correctly. And that's irrespective of whether it's a, a combi boiler system or it's a, you know, a heat pump or it's a whatever technology is attached to that low carbon, high carbon, whatever it is. Ultimately, these are the checklists you need to do. So <clears throat> my voice is going, we've got some water in the house. <laughs> so yeah, do you want, I'll, I'll pass to Rob. I'm going to have some water in a minute, but um, on to number three. So done the heat loss calculation. We're going to need to start then thinking about possibly upsizing radiators because we were now working at lower temperatures. So the lower the mean water temperature is in a radiator, the lower the output you'll get out of that radiator. So that is really important part of the calculation process as well. Once that's done and those, those radiators are sized correctly for your outside design temperature, which could be anything from minus one to minus six, who knows, in the UK, could be even more elsewhere. We've got to make sure that those radiators are going to be working and they're going to be working at their optimum efficiency. The whole point of what we're trying to do is to squeeze the maximum amount of efficiency out of any bit of plant that we've got, either existing or anything that we're designing from new. Um, we're then going to try and set our pump speed to match our mass flow rate that runs right through our systems. And hopefully then that can modulate down as the temperature warms up within the building, we don't need quite as hot a flower rate, so that will then modulate down through various different controls, which I'm sure Rich will talk about in a minute. But it's those kind of processes that, we're, that, that we, need to, uh, we need to work on. Um, I shall let... Um... Yes, you can. I'll ask you a question. So on a retrofit situation where we're trying to get the most out of a system where there's already radiators in the house, Kimbo's mentioned an awful lot over these sessions how they're mostly massive roofs for the, for, the, for the future with heat pumps, etc. Rhiannon, do you want to cover a bit about that? All I was going to say is there are so many unknowns for every individual property, like all of these things that we've got this checklist, it's all based on, you know, the perfect scenario almost. You, if you know what wattage you've got to get out of your radiators, but the fact is that Gladys loves books and has got three bookcases in that same room, you have to think around these problems. Most of the time people will facilitate that, but not always. So you have got to, you know, you might have to add like a larger radiator in the hallway or something to cover that. And But that's the practical side of it. And even down to the heat loss, you know, often people don't know what their walls are made of. They don't know if there's cavity insulation in there or not. I mean, these are practical problems. Like they think their floor is solid, but actually it's a suspended floor. You know, they they went into the loft, but um, and a patch of it has got 300 mil, but actually the rest of it is like hardly got any insulation. And you know, all of that checklist is brilliant, but it is so much to ask. It, like it is genuinely a lot of work. And I think you know the practical side of it, um, you've got to balance it. That's what I'm saying take all those things into consideration and kind of use it as a bit of a guide as to kind of where you go next and and just to to make them aware isn't it that's what we've been trying to do about the best practice and so so we we do all talk about best practice and we do all appreciate as well it isn't always easy to achieve you know it's it is customer i mean ultimately the customer pays the bills right so if the customer doesn't want to pay for your time to do this maybe that's not the customer for you. So we've got to get in the habit of walking away from jobs. If, they, if they're not going to listen to the information that you've given them and the manufacturers are supporting with that and you go and do your training and you go and you know you want some renewables and you want and someone specified that for you, if ultimately they're not going to pay you for that work, that's not the customer for you. Let that customer have a combi bashed in and do you know what I mean? Not set up correctly. But ultimately... It's, it's down to us all to get the information across and how much savings you can make, very much manufacturer side, because obviously from a manufacturer side, in the past, I'm not saying now, but there's a lot of manufacturers out there who do fluff figures, you know, and instead of actually looking at the science. And I know from the tests that we did at Salford, when we used the auto balancing TRVs, we did actually see a really good reduction in energy saving, wasn't it? So, you know, we've got to have proper science behind this when we are doing this stuff. Otherwise, we can't present the homeowners the information they need to make the informed decisions 
to spend that extra money, do these bits and pieces and actually make the system as efficient as possible. And that's a really important part of it as well, isn't it? Because lower flow temperature systems run colder radiators and the homeowner sits there going, my radiator isn't boiling hot. It's not working. What's going on? And that's all about, that's all for the installers to educate, isn't it? And about that education piece. Yeah, I always come back to uh, pumps as well. <clears throat> There's this thing that pumps are automatic. You know, it's like it, the, the, the pump cut to fit in the boiler. Boiler gets put in the box. You take it out of the box. You put it on the wall. And somehow, as if by magic, uh, the pump knows what sort of system it's going on. Now, yes, pumps are automatic, but you've got to set them first. Uh, and this is why it's so important. Again, we come back to the science of the maths that we can work out simple things like the index circuit. Uh, so we can work out what the pressure loss across the system is. Then we can set our pump and, hey, we're beginning to balance the system. I often ask people, you know, oh, you just balanced the system. What have you actually balanced to what? And they don't know because they haven't. They've just twiddled a few bits and bobs of the pair of pliers. Everything's got nice and hot. And they think, well, there you go. Jobs are good. Whereas in actual fact, you've probably got four times the amount of energy going into most of the rooms. So I'm a big person about uh, getting your pumps right. I think if, if you've got 10 minutes to spare, first 10 minutes has got to be uh, to try and set the pump. And I say well, I'm not a big fan of rule of thumb, but anything with 22 and 15 mil pipe, you can set to about 30 percent. And if you've got microbore, you're looking at about 65, 70 percent. And if you just do that alone, an inspired guess, that's going to make a difference. You don't notice it when you've done it. You're not going to get a round of applause from anyone. But over the next 10 years, when that boiler's running, that's going to save them a substantial amount of energy. So every, every little bit helps. I think the thing is, we're just trying to get closer to the truth. Um, doesn't matter what you do. I mean, the government have set some really weird targets of, I think it was a, um, a, a net 12% saving on emissions over the next, um, uh, to 2028 or something like that. Well, we could beat that now. Just, we could absolutely smash those targets now, just with some basic system balancing. I mean, why would you, that, that it typically could do, you know, 70 miles an hour for argument's sake, but because of your poor, commissioning of the car or your poor servicing of the car, you're only getting 25 miles an hour out of it or 25 miles to the gallon out of it. That's what I meant. You could get 70 miles to the gallon out of this car as opposed to 25 miles to the gallon. You wouldn't do it. You'd put it into a garage and you'd get it done. But we can do exactly that same thing with heating systems and we can do it very, very simply and very, very quickly. And I think that's the, the maths are really not that difficult. And that's the, that's the point I'm trying to get across to, to, to get it. I was just going to say that was one of the best things I learned from your course, Kimbo, when I was on it. Like, I really enjoyed actually thinking about what the pump was doing and where we need to set it. And just looking at the curves, looking at the graphs um, and and giving yourself time to learn that stuff, I think is really important. And, and those two days were just absolutely brilliant. I loved them. The key thing about pumps. So we had an we've had a few interesting conversations today, right? So we've got a pump set up with some static and dynamic balancing valves on our stand, okay? So, asking installers as they come through what the difference is. They don't know, okay? What does the auto button on the, on the pump do? They don't know, okay? Still installers right now, fitting pumps, fitting balancing valves or static valves, still don't know why they're doing what they're doing. We've got miles of education left to do yet. So if you do want to see the difference though, come to our stand, we'll have a little chat. And maybe after that, you'll realize the differences. But it's it's just an eye opener for me because I you, you, you assume after we've been banging the drum that, and even some, what we found today, I found today, I'm not going to name names, but some of the guys I actually know and work with and deal with, and they still didn't know the proper answers to them. So, you know, and it just goes to show me that maybe I've not communicated that enough. Do you know what I mean? Or, you know, so we've still got we still got sessions to do, which, you know, to try and keep banging that drum. Maybe they missed the session on it. I don't know. But, you know, ultimately, there's still education still to do from our side. Do you know what I mean? So we've got a long, long way to go. It's not me being I'm being more critical this year because last year I was quite optimistic about everything. I was sort of the Rhiannon of last year do you know what i mean but this year i'm like right we just need to get on with this now yeah we keep talking about this all the time we've got these things now we've got this if you don't know how to do this 
ask us. That's what, and that's what I mean. If you've not done it, exactly. I don't know if they can hear me. Most of the stuff that's on this checklist, I'll be putting the checklist on the Facebook group as well, so that you've got a reference to it. The guys have got it on their stand. Or everyone's got it on their stand. And you know what? What else have we got on there? You know, on the front, we talk about power flushing. And we're talking about balancing the system. We've talked about that, taking the gas out of it to stop that build up. What was the percentage that we were talking about? It's about 20, about 20%. All oh, right. Um, 84%. Um, so about, yeah, 84% of warranty call outs are due to, due to poor water quality. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at, um, think of something called Henry's Law, if anyone's ever heard of Henry's Law, um, go to bed this evening, go to your kitchen tap take a glass of water out of your kitchen tap at 10 degrees, which is what it's supposed to be. There you go, glass of that. Take it upstairs, put it on a bedside cabinet. Don't touch it until the morning. When you look at that glass of water in the morning, you look around the edge of that glass and there's loads of bubbles all inside that glass. That is Henry's law. That is the dissolved oxygen with inside that fluid coming out of that fluid as the temperature rises. And that is sitting inside your heating system. So you've got two things here. If you don't take that oxygen out of the system, it's going to oxidize. And it's going to start causing sludge and black horrible sludge within your system that makes the system performance absolutely woeful shortens the lifespan of all the plant component failure uh, pump speeds everything just gets trashed and ruined by oxidization within a system this is something that if we don't address this so it's um it's the cheapest component in any kind of system and the one we care the most you know the least about from what i can see which is ridiculous you can't just dump a you know a, a liter of, of chemical in it because you can actually overdose you know most most systems are well under 100 litres. Yeah, most, most systems are only 30 or 40 litres. And yet one bottle of that chemical will treat up to about 200 litres of water. It's, it's ridiculous. We're overdosing with this stuff and it causes damage. So in you know, getting that water quality perfect and getting the, 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 the dissolved oxygen out of that system is, is a huge part of system design and, and monitoring and ongoing maintenance. We did a whole session on the um, water quality part and we were talking about the VDI and um, all of the tools that are used and the flushing and all of that sort of stuff. The wall really, really interesting one. And maybe one that we'll repeat this year, maybe as we come into the heating season. So what else have we got on there? Set the flow temp down. Who wants to take that one? With a boiler flow temp, you just got to think of it, the, the lower we can get it, the more efficient that appliance is. Okay, all the, all the tests we did at Salford University, I, I basically, it was my research, it was my testing. We showed, we showed a dramatic result of get, if we can get it in condensing mode and lower, so it's really important, the lower bit is the important bit, because we, right, so dew point on a gas boiler is 54 degrees Celsius, okay? So if we can get it below 50, so ironically, we set it to 55 degrees. So, you know, dew point's 54, but AO building regs, we'll put it up to 55, you know what I mean? So. There's a bit of irony in everything, but ultimately what we need to do is try not to, because we're, talk, we're talking about narrowing Delta T's as well at the moment. So with the, with the onset of hybrid systems and stuff like that, we're actually talking about narrowing that Delta T of the gas boiler. The, the only problem with that is if we have a 55 degree flow and we narrow it to DT5, we got a 50 return temperature, which it is in condensing mode. Just. Just. So we have got to have a bit of a think about how we go ahead with the hybrid side of it and stuff like that. But ultimately, new, new, new building regulations now state 55 degrees maximum. maximum. There's a couple of get out clauses there. But, you know, we, we, we were talking about net zero before. We don't really want to get out of anything. Design the system for 55 degrees. That's what we need to do, OK, to get the most efficiency for your customer, for the longevity of the boiler and the appliance. 55 degree is it, OK? We, we don't want to be skirting around the fact that Mrs. Miggins has got small radiators and, oh, you know, I'll design it at 70 still. That is not going to help your customer going forwards, all right? So we just need to make sure that that actually happens because if we don't, when we come to a heat pump transition, we're going to have a little bit of an issue where we're still running at 70 degree flow temps. All the rads only run at 70 degree flow temps and they're going to have to spend that money anyway. So isn't it better we try and encourage that now actually work with the building regulations and actually try and you know try and actually make everything work properly yeah, definitely. So. yeah. no i just found i that 
absolutely everything that you've said. But in one of the forums that I've seen today, um, some of the gas engineers were saying that people have sort of coming to them and going, oh, can you lower my flow temperature and this that, and the other? And they're pulling these faces. It's going to save me money if you lower my flow temperature. And the engineer is going, well... But there's a there's a very simple simple way to look at this, and it's you know we've all been saying this mantra for ages. And it's a, it's low, long, and slow. If you can do it, if you can build something to that, you know we we don't want to be doing 150 miles an hour down the motorway. We want to be sitting there nice and cruising speed. So it's just it's, it's all moving along at the same time, and it just keeps on plodding away all the time. And the bottom line is that if you've got a client that is saying, well my you know my, my system is definitely not working because the radiators aren't hot, you have to say something like, well are you cold? And nine times out of ten they're not cold. So there's, there's your answer. It's as simple as that. Low, long, and slow. And that's all you can do. Design. All the tools are out there. They're cheap to get. It's, the maths are really not difficult to do. A couple of days, of course, is a bit of input of doing what Kim and I do and what, what our good friend Richie is going to be doing pretty soon as well. You know, it, it, it really is not a big investment of time to get up to this stage. And I promise you, when you've designed a system and you do all the maths, and then when you fire the system up and it all gets up to temperature as you said it was going to do through the maths, it's a very good feeling. Are we done or got anything else? Want to carry on? Carry on? Yeah, okay. So um, I think we've probably covered everything there. We've covered it all anyway on the Facebook group and we will be doing it again. You know, as we come into heating season, we'll be covering off all the rest of this stuff. We've got loads of training on this flyer. You guys know that anyway. James's virtual training. We've got the Facebook group videos. We've got the nine degree network, but also we've got some references on here for Kimbo's couple of days, one day, two day, three days. Um, at, the, at the Heating Academy and also Rob's Heat Engineer software um, and courses. So there's the link to that on there. We'll put it on the group. There will be a resource that you guys can look at. And just, just as a reminder, you know, just as the things to think about. And like Richard said, if you don't know, then just ask. And these guys are on the group. They're really happy to answer questions. And um, I think that's it. I just need to say... You can ask anonymously. Oh, if you want to ask anonymously, you can make your post um, from an anonymous person. But, you know, it's, we're all friends here in the group. Some people don't like Twitter. No. So, uh, just for me to say thank you to you all. Thanks so much. And for doing this live today. It's been great fun. And I will see you all in the winter season. Thank you. See you soon, guys.